30 years later, I still remember the names Zachary Baumel, Yehuda Katz, Svi Feldman, and Ron Arad. They are Israeli POW MIAs. Baumel, Katz, and Feldman went MIA in 1982 when their tank was shelled during the Lebanon War. Ron Arad was captured in 1986 by Lebanese militias when his plane went down during a bombing raid. I was in high school 30 years ago, and during USY youth groups, we would write letters to UN officials, urging them to help broker deals so that Israel could at least learn the fate of the four boys, as they were called, and if they were dead, to let us bury them properly in the land of Israel. They were young men, young men sent to do the fighting of political leaders who couldn't yet make peace. We knew that Israeli brothers and sisters our age, the ones in high school, would all be serving in the IDF in just a few years while we were in college. We felt a connection to the people in Israel and wanted to make sure that our letters and our voices were heard. It took a long time, at least for these four boys. In 2019, Israel brokered a deal with Russia and Syria, and Baumel's body came home for a burial. We still don't know where Katz and Feldman's body are. And in 2021, rumors were confirmed that Ron Arad was killed in 1988. He spent two years literally in captivity. And Israel actually is still running intelligence operations to determine where he is buried and they could use that as a bargaining trip to get his body back. And if you drive on Northern Boulevard and Community Drive, you'll see that there is one of those black MIA PIW flags under the, Israel, the American flag. War is still a part of humanity, but ensuring that individuals don't become forgotten pawns of these wars is also part of humanity. We can honor veterans who return home, and we can even honor the fallen when we have their bodies for burial. But we cannot honor prisoners of war while they're imprisoned, and we cannot rest until we know the fate of every single MIA and hopefully bury them on home soil. Then they don't become pawns of war anymore. They become human beings again. I bring up these memories because we all know that recently we had the exchange of Brittany Griner for a Russian prisoner, a violent one that he is. And because we just read about Judah's plea to free Benjamin from imprisonment. Judaism, and of course Israel and America, all support Pidyon Shvuim, freeing the captives. And we all understand that there is no textbook or guide to obtain people's freedom from enemies and adversaries. Yes, there was argument and discussion. Was it worth it to make this exchange for Griner? Jewish sources have what to say and show us that there's no easy answer. The Talmud and Baba Bratra says that Pidyon Shvuim Mitzvah Rabahi. It is a great mitzvah and says that captivity is worse than starvation and death. You're literally sitting in deprivation of any connection, of any information to know when your ordeal might end. And yes, you wonder if the people at home even know about your fate and whether they're trying to free you or not. Maimonides rules later on, the one who ignores the ransom of a captive is guilty of transgressing the commandments, several of them. You shall not harden your heart, he says. Do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
he lived at a time when there was a lot more hostage taking and ransoming. And yes, communities would have to literally pull together their meager funds to free them. And that is what Pidyon Shuim was. And it was considered a mitzvah rabbah. And we see actually in the Cairo Geniza actual letters from Maimonides trying to fundraise for redeeming the captives. We also describe in our daily prayers that God is matir asirim, freeing the bound and the captive. But our rabbinic texts also tell us that there are some limits to this great mitzvah, but it's rather vague. The Mishnah says that one does not ransom captives for more than their value, what that means we don't know, because of tikkun olam, and one does not need to risk themselves to make captives escape, to break them out of their captivity because of tikkun olam. What does the Mishnah mean by tikkun olam? We know it as literally fixing the world, and that's how we use it today. But I think the Mishnah understands it, tikkun olam, as for the good order of the world, a precaution that we need to look out for the general good. What does this mean? Some say, don't fall for really exorbitant high ransoms. And also be careful of how you might exchange for them. Because there's a worry that they'll, people will see, oh, there's profit, and taking hostage will continue to do so. I think the Mishnah is just saying, use your head. Try to sort of weigh out as best as you can as a community how to free the captives. We know these same debates took place as the U.S. negotiated for the release of Brittany Griner with Russia of all countries as she was sentenced to nine years for drug possession. And we also know that Paul Whelan is still imprisoned in Russia with a 16-year sentence for false charges of espionage. He went to Russia for a wedding and never came home. Apparently, when they were negotiating, at least according to the Biden administration, only Griner was up for negotiation. And they obviously demanded an extremely high price for her. Try to put yourself in the shoes of the negotiators. Do you accept a lopsided deal for the sake of bringing Griner home? Or do you consider the price too high for too little of a return? Is this murderer going to continue his terrorist acts? It's a hard judgment call and one that we need to be wary to criticize too harshly. I will speak for myself and that the image of any American prisoner at a labor camp in Siberia is scary enough to warrant almost any exchange. If there is an opportunity to free one, we should do so. It is beautiful and heartening to see Brittany reunited with her wife, her family, and her friends. And I must note that the first thing that Brittany said was that we need to continue to work to free Paul. And she also urged us to write letters to Paul. She says that the letters that she received in prison from Americans told her she was not forgotten and gave her the hope that one day her ordeal would be over. So as one of the first things we should do in 2023, let us, like I did 30 years ago in USY, put pen to paper and write to Paul Whelan. After the service, if you like, I actually have sheets of paper with his address on it. It's from freepaulwhelan.com, and actually to send something to a consular, it's just a first-class stamp to Washington, D.C., that will then make its way to Moscow. And you can also send an email at freepaulwhelan at gmail.com, and they'll try to get the message to him.
I conclude with a prayer. Master of the universe, we pray that you speedily release Whelan from prison. May Israel learn where Ron Arad is buried. And may we learn the fates of all American MIAs. For you are the knower of secrets and the matir asurim, the freer of captives. And let us all say, Amen. <laughs>